Hello. Today we will be discussing the 18th century social and political movement known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment had a huge impact on the creation of the United States, as well as on the French Revolution, which impacted all of Europe in the 19th century. So, what was the Enlightenment? Well, it was a couple things. It was a philosophical movement, which was led by a group of people known as the philosophes. Now, the philosophes aren't really, they're not philosophers, they're more like social activists. The Enlightenment was fueled by the printing press, as we saw with the Protestant Reformation, uh, but it was a response to all of the changes that were happening in Europe in the 18th century, social changes, political, economic the Enlightenment was also a political development, though, uh, through something called enlightened despotism. Uh, despot is basically like a dictator. Uh, and so the Enlightenment philosophies were applied to a traditional monarchical rule. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. Um, there was a response to the Enlightenment, just as there was a response to the Protestant Reformation, and it actually stimulated a religious revival. So as the philosophes and the Enlightenment are sort of moving away from religion or taking a new look at religion, you then have a, a, a Christian revival as a response to that. And it was really, it was a, it was a grassroots revival. It wasn't being driven by any uh, religious authorities. It was just, uh, just people. So the philosophes really, they, they reorient Europe's view of itself. For a long time, it had thought of itself as just being like the leftovers of the Greco-Roman age, uh, and that Europe had uh, diminished as a result of the intervening years, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and so forth. Uh, the, the philosophes really look at the world through the lens of progress as opposed to stasis. They really think that um, people are capable of changing the world for the better, which is still a philosophy that exists uh, politically even today. So the printing press is key to the spread of enlightenment ideas. Uh, we have a new reading public once you have the spread of books uh, and the growth of education that we see coming out of the Reformation. Uh, you have more readers, you have more of a desire to, to learn to read because there's actually stuff for you to read. We also have a new career that comes out of this and that is the independent writer. Uh, there were a few writers in the Renaissance era, but it's really during the 18th century, during the enlightenment in Europe, that you start to get large numbers of uh, writers because the, you can make money now being a writer because you can sell books. Uh, both the state and the church engage in censorship to push back against enlightenment ideas that challenge their authorities. Uh, and that's again, that's both the the state or the you know the monarch or the church, uh, which led writers to often use pseudonyms. A pseudonym is a it means fake name, uh, and so you write under a pseudonym, and then they don't know who you really are. Uh, the censorship also stimulated an underground book trade. So they were publishing books that would have been censored, and then they're trading them. Uh, you know, on the down low. Um, universities were really not in involved with the Enlightenment. They're just too conservative. The Enlightenment is being pushed by, you know, this group of, of intellectuals called the philosophes. And another thing that comes out of this period is the idea, the concept of public opinion. Once you are spreading ideas uh, far and wide, both through books as well as through newspapers, and people start to be connected and their ideas start to be connected in a way that they never had been before. And, you know, nobody can control public opinion. Nobody, right? A political leader can't just stand up and say, you're all going to believe this now. Once you have a more literate population and you have this wider spread of ideas, it really becomes impossible to, to lock down. Let's look briefly at the background of the Enlightenment now. The scientific revolution is a big part of the background of the Enlightenment because it provides new methods of inquiry. 
And as people become more educated, they tend to have less faith in religion because there is a conflict between science and religion. And we still uh, experience that the tension between science and religion uh, right up to you know, the present day and the various crises that America is dealing with in 2020. Uh, there's, as we said, there's a conflict between the Bible and Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics uh, contradicts a lot of what is in the Bible. The earth must be more than 5,000 years old based upon science. Uh, and so there's a conflict right there. You know, the philosophers and, and these, these early thinkers are really kind of bringing up the question as to whether or not God is still relevant in their age. Um, and one thing that we got from the period known as absolutism is this concept of a divine right monarchy, that God is giving the monarch the authority to be an absolute ruler. But can there be divine right monarchies if there's no divinity, right? So we're starting to have people even question the existence of God, and that challenges this social structure called subordination, which is you know, the king's on top and then the nobles are beneath them and, and you you know, you have this this hierarchical structure. And so it's like, how dare these, the, you know, these intellectuals, these scientists, these philosophers, how dare they challenge the the social norms of the day? A new religion develops during this period called deism. It's a it's a natural religion. And it's based upon the idea that, yes, there must have been some uh, divinity that helped uh, create the universe, but it it doesn't uh, it doesn't take the form of the Judeo Christian God. Uh, deists study the world. That's their manner of worship is to investigate. You know, part of this is okay. Well. If there is a God, well, he created everything. And so if he created everything, he created Newtonian physics. And so if he created Newtonian physics that challenges things that are written in the Bible, then mm, maybe the Bible is not the literal word of God. This is their thinking. Uh, they were huge proponents of education. This really comes out of humanism uh, from the Renaissance. And they really did want to save the parts of Christianity that could go along with science. So the book of Genesis is hard to reconcile because that's where you get the age of the planet around 5,000 years. Uh, and, you know, the, the scientific revolution really challenged that notion. Deists also thought that all religions were equally valid. Uh, so they're not really even they're not really fully embracing Christianity as a whole, even. It's hard to argue that deism is a form of Christianity. This was a religion that was very popular with the American founding fathers, including Benjamin Franklin, as you see there on the slide, uh, as well as Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and they felt that, you know, humans were not innately good or bad. Uh, you know, the, some of the Enlightenment writers really thought that, you know, like John Locke thought that there is inherent goodness in humans, whereas a lot of other philosophers, as well as the book of Genesis, uh, feel that there is this innate sinfulness in people. Um, and deism really kind of allowed its followers to move on from this Christian preoccupation with sin and with sinfulness and kind of freed them to focus on other things. Let's now look for a moment at the philosophers. The philosophers were not philosophers, and that's sort of confusing based upon their name. They were they were activists. They were social and political activists who had issues with some of the stuff that was happening in society. They thought society was too superstitious, which was sort of their view of Christianity. They thought that free thought was stifled. Uh, you know, everybody in Europe lived under an absolute monarch. Uh, they also all had problems with the aristocracy. They saw the aristocracy as being uh, lazy, that they promoted idleness as a value as opposed to industry. Uh, and they also had a problem with the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, that's how you pronounce that word there, 
Uh, it's French and it refers to sort of the urban middle to upper middle class. So you're talking about merchants uh, would be an example of people that would be found in the bourgeoisie. Uh, they wanted to create a world where reason was above everything, particularly above faith, that reason was the thing that kind of drove society. And they really, uh, the commercial classes in those cities, they really uh, spoke to those groups of people, the petty merchants. Uh, and and really on behalf of anybody who was oppressed by tyranny. And, and again, they lived in these absolute monarchies that could get pretty uh, tyrannical. However, they were willing to accept despotism or you know dictatorship or absolute monarchy in the name of reason and reform. So if an absolute monarch could prove that they shared values with the philosophers, then they weren't terribly interested in having, you know, a democracy, for example, which up until uh, you know the foundation of the American Republic, nobody had democracy. Now, John Locke is sort of the proto-philosoph, if you recall. He was that uh, philosopher from the late 17th century. He supported the Glorious Revolution in overthrowing uh, the last absolute monarch of England, James II. He got exiled briefly uh, as a consequence of that support. But he believed that humans were innately good or peaceful. Uh, he also believed that all religions were worthy of respect, but none should receive priority. None should be placed above any other religion. He also saw tolerance as a virtue, which is, you know, that's a belief that a, a lot of uh, Americans, certainly not all, uh, but a lot of Americans agree with that concept. Uh, he also laid the foundation for the modern liberal state. So he believed in community and communitarian ideas over individualism. He believed in representative government, and he believed that all human beings were endowed with certain natural rights. Um, and as you can maybe tell from some of this language, he had a huge influence over uh, all of the founders, but particularly Thomas Jefferson. I mean, Thomas Jefferson maybe should have been uh, sued for plagiarism because of how much of Locke's writing ends up in the Declaration of Independence. The most famous and influential of the philosophers was Voltaire, and Voltaire was a member of the French bourgeoisie, that's the urban middle class, uh, and he was not beloved by the absolute monarchs of, of France, and he was imprisoned and later exiled by Louis XV for trying to spread his uh, seditious ideas. He did find freedom in England, and when he got to England, he found himself influenced by the writings of both John Locke and Isaac Newton. Eventually, he moves on to Switzerland, which is a neutral country in Europe that is a center of, uh, was the center of the Protestant Reformation for a time. And there, he really set about tormenting the French uh, king with his writings. But he also satirized uh, some of his fellow philosophers. His, his most famous work was a book called uh, Candide, where he really satirized the philosophers' belief in, in, in progress, sort of conquering all. Like Locke, he believed that uh, no religion had a monopoly on the truth, that there was value in all faiths. And he actually wrote the, the first uh, sort of world history textbook. So you can thank him for uh, really kind of being the reason why this course exists. Another really important philosopher is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he was a little bit different than some of the other philosophers because he had a poor background. He was not a member of the bourgeoisie. One of his most famous quotes, uh, which you'll still see pop up today in political context, is, man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. And he also believed that property was really the root of all evil. And so here you can see Rousseau planting the first seeds that would later form socialism, communism, uh, and some aspects of 
uh, you know, the democratic socialist platform. Uh, he believed in a social contract. That's a term that was lifted from Thomas Hobbes, who we looked at in a previous video. And he felt that private interests should be below public good. So in this conflict that America still deals with today between uh, communalism, the the emphasis being on what is good for the community versus individualism, what is best for individual people. And so, you know, Rousseau is definitely in favor of supporting the public good over individual interests. And he felt that, you know, everybody has to give up some of their rights to uh, assure the collective good. So, you know, the, one of the conflicts that we're dealing with in 2020 is over wearing a mask to uh, combat COVID. And there are some people who believe that their rights trump the other side's belief in trying to do something for the collective. If we all wear masks, fewer of us die. And that is, according to Rousseau, something that is necessary for the social contract. Uh, he also believes that freedom and equality are inseparable. And that's an important idea because we talk about freedom and we talk about equality. But, you know, if we're equal in rights, but unequal in wealth, then how can there be justice? Right. We can say that everyone is free and equal, but if other people have vast amounts of wealth, then, you know, can there be justice? And we know in our society today that that's a real problem, that there's kind of two criminal justice systems, uh, one for the wealthy and one for everybody else. Uh, and, and so that's kind of this open question that we're still looking at, you know, 250 years later is, is you know, what are our values as a society? Some other important philosophers include Diderot. Diderot created the first encyclopedia. He coined that term and he, he was attempting to catalog all of human knowledge, right? So he was really sort of um, anticipating the internet, you know, a couple hundred years before it arose. Uh, he commissioned articles from authors like Voltaire and Rousseau. And at that point it was the largest publishing venture in in human history uh when the first volume there are multiple volumes i don't know if you've if you've ever seen like a set of encyclopedias there's a whole bunch of volumes uh that cover different topics and uh it was censored and it was denounced by religious and political leaders and the pope actually said that anybody who read it would be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. So, you know, a little, little, little bit of an overreaction. Uh, another philosoph was, uh, was the first economist in history, and his name was Adam Smith. He was English, and he published an incredibly important book called The Wealth of Nations. And he's kind of on the other side of the, the argument from Rousseau, because he says that that overall, public wealth gets maximized when everybody pursues their own selfish interests. So he's sort of saying that, you know, the individual and the individual's goals are uh, more important and it, or perhaps even benefit uh, the public interest at large. And he also uh, had a belief that we still have amongst some political uh, and economic conservatives, which is that markets function best when they're unregulated by government. Now, we have seen throughout world history and throughout American history, many, many examples of how that is not true, uh, that mar markets actually function best when there is regulation, because if there's no regulation, then those uh, businesses can go hog wild and not worry about the rights of consumers and the rights of workers and things like that. Uh, another philosopher, Montesquieu, he, he his main contribution was that he felt that there should be a separation of powers in government. And that's a concept that made it into a lot of uh, constitutions once they start to be written. And of course, ours was really the first written constitution. Uh, and that's in a very important 
part of our government. We do not want a government in which one uh, part of the government is all powerful. We want to have a, a, a separation of powers. We want to have a legislature that can check the executive, for example. So I hope you can see how a lot of these ideas that come out of this movement are still incredibly relevant in the world that you're living in today. Uh, a guy named Langue uh, predicted that there would be this widening income gap between rich and poor. See if that sounds familiar to you. And that that widening income gap would actually lead to revolution. Uh, this has happened a few different times, and, and it's never happened as a full-scale revolution in America. The American Revolution and the Civil War were not based upon this income gap, but there have been periods of time in American history where that income gap gets so, so big that it creates a progressive political movement to try to rein in business. And we saw that in the uh, sort of later part of the 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century. And you could make a pretty strong argument that in the last 10 years, this issue has become worse and worse and worse. And we're starting to see that that uh, progressive snapback against uh, this this huge income gap. Uh, and then the last philosopher that we'll take a look at is Immanuel Kant. And he's another one who really is more of an actual philosopher because you know, he said that, that, that the mind is what creates reality and that reality is a subjective experience and that our brains can never know true reality because it's, it's being, reality is being filtered through us. This is how, you know, you can have people who have vastly different ideas uh, about something based upon the same sort of objective experience. Let's take a look at enlightened despotism now. So what is it? Uh, there were absolute monarchs across Europe who read the philosophes. I mean, the absolute monarchs, for the most part, were pretty educated people. And they wanted to blend some of those new ideas with, in, into their country, but also preserve their absolute rule, which seems like a sort of a, a contradiction. Uh, although a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers were perfectly cool with with despotism, as long as it it preserved their their values, um, but this ended up undermining that basic societal structure that had existed for a thousand years between the monarchy and the nobility and the church. Um, some of the sort of the enlightened despots that we're going to take a look at here would be Catherine the Great uh, of Russia, Frederick the Great of Prussia, who has come up before, and then Joseph II, who wasn't nearly as great as the other two. Catherine the Great, who was a German woman who was the uh, the Empress of Russia or the Tsarina, uh, she was in power in the latter part of the 18th century. Uh, and after Peter the Great, you know, sometime before, uh, there was really weak leadership uh, throughout the, the middle part of the 18th century. And during that time, the nobles were able to reassert themselves and gain more power. Uh, at the same time, the peasants were be being treated very poorly. Um, in fact, you know, most of the common people were serfs and that's effectively slavery. They were treated as, as property. Um, now, Catherine came to power in an interesting way because she assassinated her husband and then took over. Uh, and she really is responsible for orienting uh, Russia even further to the West than Peter the Great did. Again, she is she's German, so that that's kind of where where her eye is as well. Uh, and for a time, she was a reformer. Uh, she expanded publishing. She wanted to have European style schools. Uh, she she helped fund Diderot's encyclopedia. Uh, for a time, she wanted to actually reform the, the legal code in Russia, and she felt, at least for a period of time, that uh, all persons should be treated equally before the law, which is, you know, that's, that's an important concept that we have here in our society. But she was an expansionist. She fought a couple of wars with uh, the Ottoman Empire, and... At a certain point, she abandons reform. 
because there were just too many people protesting. It's sort of you light the match and people are like, yay, freedom and equality. We like that. But an absolute monarch isn't going to like that uh, completely. She conquered. She she drove uh, south to the Black Sea and was able to successfully conquer a lot of the lands around the Black Sea that, that had been in Ottoman hands for a few hundred years. Um, but she was unable to conquer Istanbul. That had been a long term goal of Russia. And when I say long term, I mean for 800 years that they had wanted to be able to gain control of first Constantinople. And then after they changed the name to Istanbul, because it controls access to the Mediterranean Sea. And Russia has been trying to get access to a warm water, a warm water port um, for hundreds and hundreds of years because their only natural ports are in places in the far north that sometimes uh, freeze over or in, 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 in the far north that always freeze over in the wintertime. Uh, she also was facing rebellion at home and that forced her to uh, abandon some of her reforms and get the nobility on her side. Uh, the nobility were exempt from imperial service, so they didn't have to fight in the army anymore. Uh, and they were in placed in total charge of their provinces. So we're sort of slipping back towards something that looks more like feudalism. And the exchange there was that the nobility would stop messing around in the royal business. Uh, but this government under Catherine really kind of stops caring about human rights the way that it had earlier. And, and in fact, it gets so bad that she ends up banning the writings of her friend Voltaire. So we see this, this snapback from being an enlightened despot to being, you know, a regular despot. Now, the dominant figure in Europe for the middle part of the 18th century is Frederick the Great of Prussia. He is the most admired monarch of 18th century Europe, and he really is a philosoph. Uh, you know, he's not a patron of the philosophes like Catherine was. He is a philosoph. Uh, and he felt that there he didn't believe in divine right. He's, a, he's an absolute monarch who didn't believe in divine right. Right. He felt like the purpose of having power was to be in service of the people. And he really thought of himself not as a king or an emperor, but as as the first servant of the people. But he felt like a monarch should be above all interests, all sort of special interests, and then he can govern in the common good. So he's above the interests of the royalty, he's, or excuse me, the, the aristocracy, he's above the interests of the common people, and that way he can sort of judge in an honest way. So, you know, by having all of the power this is this is sort of a contradiction and, and, and it's hard to agree with in the age that we live in now. But but he felt that by having all of the power, by being an absolute monarch, then he's above desire and he can't become a tyrant. Eh, that's 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 a hard one to swallow. Um, but he didn't have any scandals and he didn't have any vices. So he wasn't a drinker. He wasn't a womanizer. Uh, in fact, it is believed that he was not a womanizer at all because he was gay and he was actually not terribly in the closet. You know, I guess that's one benefit of being an absolute monarch is, you know, you don't have to worry about people persecuting you for your 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 uh, sexual orientation. Uh, Frederick supported industry. He promoted agriculture. He actually drained swamps. Uh, he promoted education. He he was cool with refugees and he wanted to make sure that the law was codified that the law was was actually written down and dealt with consistently um not a bad guy based upon all of those things except for the part where people don't have you know the kinds of rights that people have uh today you know prussia it wasn't free there were still lots of of serfs particularly in the eastern part of Prussia. Um, and the merchant class really didn't have any power. There was no bourgeoisie to speak of in Prussia during this period. Now, Frederick really loved the nobility and the army. It was it was the most, uh, the, the aristocracy had more power in Prussia than in any other country in Europe. The, uh, the, the, arm, the officer corps of the military, the only nobility could be in the officer corps. Uh, and, you know, 
while he seemed like a pretty cool guy who believed in all of these cool things, he also uh, helped uh, devour to annihilate Poland, right? Poland ceases to exist in the late 18th century and doesn't reappear as an independent nation until after World War I. So the Polish people didn't go anywhere, but they no longer had their own state. They were spread between Prussia and Russia and Austria. Um, during the Seven Years' War, he was being attacked by basically everybody in Europe, and he still won anyway. So, you know, he wasn't just sort of this, this enlightened despot, but he's also a pretty good military leader. Uh, but he spent the rest of his reign at rebuilding Prussia after the Seven Years' War because it was he won, but it was pretty devastating on their society. Now, Joseph II is a little bit different than the first two, because even though he made the most serious attempt at being an enlightened despot, uh, there were some fundamental problems with his country that both Prussia and Russia didn't have to deal with. And, and for starters, it's not really one country, right? You can see here what Prussia you know, sort of some of the overlap, all of the stuff that's in orange uh, or the dark, or that's, that is that's the Austrian empire, right? Um, and so it spreads from Flanders on the English Channel all the way to Russia. And the peoples had absolutely nothing in common. They were not linguistically connected. They were not culturally connected. The only thing that connected them is the Habsburg ruler that ruled over the what becomes the Austrian Empire. It still sort of overlaps with the Holy Roman Empire, at least until Napoleon gets rid of the Holy Roman Empire. So you have Poles, you have Flemish, those are the people of Flanders, modern day Belgians, uh, Hungarians, Germans, Italians, they're all a part of this very difficult to rule uh, empire. And then there were regions that had a tremendous amount of self-rule like Bohemia and Hungary. Um, he did centralize the government. Uh, he did essentially create a free trade zone. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, it's almost a customs union more than a, than a country. So if you live in Flanders and you want to trade with Bohemia, there's not going to be any uh, taxation or anything like that. That's, that's, that's just to transfer from one point to another. So it was a very difficult nation to rule. Sadly, Joseph II really kind of wasn't up to the task. Joseph II had some good ideas. He abolished serfdom. He ended censorship. He established the freedom of religion. He gave civil rights to the Jews. He said that marriage was a civil contract and that witchcraft was going to no longer be in the criminal code. Uh, he enforced equality before the law for a time. And he really tried to use his power for the betterment of all of humanity. He was really, really outraged by intolerance, but he ended up annoying everybody. The nobility hated him because he took away their power and that he wanted human rights and the nobility didn't. Uh, the church was annoyed with him because he took their land and some of their wealth. And the peasantry also, actually, even though they were the beneficiaries of some of his programs, they were just they were too confused by how fast reform was happening. And they sort of fell back into a, a, a natural conservatism, which is kind of sad because, you know, so many of these reforms existed to actually uh, help them. Uh, as a consequence, he had to retaliate against all of these forces that were working against him, which led him to reimpose censorship. Uh, he got rid of due process under the law. He started, uh, you know, he had a secret police who was spying on his population, uh, and he's really searching for traitors to to him, to his rule. Uh, sadly, he died at at 48, which even for that period was kind of young, uh, and because he had just been beaten down by the opposition, he was so uh, disliked. And after his death, then all of those reforms got rolled back and even serfdom got reimposed, at least in the eastern part of the Austrian Empire. Now, just as the Protestant Reformation triggered a Catholic Counter-Reformation, the Enlightenment triggers a Counter-Enlightenment. 
so the Enlightenment was really seen as an attack on religion, and religion was being attacked over doctrine, its beliefs, as well as its wealth and privilege. And in fact, the Jesuit order was in, was briefly disbanded in the 1770s. It came back, and you know the Jesuits are still uh, in a very important organization within the Roman Catholic Church. But starting in the late 1600s, you get something called grassroots religion. And this is something that, you know, we're very familiar with in the modern era in America. But in this period of time, that was pretty radical. Like, uh, you know, religion was supposed to be driven by organizations and, and, and individual leaders like John Calvin or Martin Luther. But this is very different. This is this is this is bottom up religion. This is religion that is coming from the people, and then that causes the leaders to have to change. So one uh, one form of this sort of grassroots religious revival is called Pietism. And pietism kind of is an outgrowth of a combination of Christianity and some German mysticism. And it was actually, it was the dominant spiritual movement in Germany by the year 1700. Uh, another form that comes out of this period is, is, a, is a form of Protestant faith that still exists today. And we have Methodist churches here, you know, in Santa Fe and all over the country. Um, so, but it, this came out of England and it really sort of said that virtue was based upon, you know, piety, of course, but also, uh, thriftiness, which sometimes we would refer to as being cheap in the modern era, uh, and hard work. So you have this, this combination of, of religion. And that's also kind of comes out of Calvinism in a way that, that, you know, you're practicing your faith through your work, uh, in America, in North America, you know, because we have the British colonies by the late 1600s, early 1700s, you have what was called the, the Great Awakening, or sometimes it's referred to as the first Great Awakening because we've had a few more throughout American history. But it was led by an Englishman who traveled all around America. And you can see that painting there is is a representation of him speaking to common people, I believe, in Virginia. Uh, Whitefield opposed secularism, which, you know, making institutions less religious, uh, as well as deism, which we know is very popular uh, amongst the educated elite in North America. Ultimately, the goal is to uh, bring, you know, Christianity back, not that it had completely gone, but but really to to uh, focus more on good works and communal worship and personal piety. So you know, the modern Protestant faiths that are practiced here in America, you know, that's kind of there, that that still exists as, as the, the foundation of modern faiths like Methodism and Lutheranism and so forth. Uh, the Catholics also had their counter enlightenment and the Catholics sought to, similarly to those religious revivals, to reform their faith make it more about personal faith rather than, you know, you're being told what to do from above, a little less dogma, which is sort of like the official teachings. And the way that this counter enlightenment manifested itself were through two forms called one called quietism and another called Jansenism. Um, unlike the, the grassroots Protestantism and, and those forms of, of, religious revival, this is, you know, these two are of elite origin. So it's not bottom up the way that we see with with some of those those Protestant counter enlightenment movements. Um, but they did emphasize personal faith and trying to get away from religious dogma. And it was pretty popular by the 1730s. Two thirds of the people of Paris were Jansenists. Now, again, they're still Catholics. This is a subgroup of Catholics, but that just shows how interested the common people of Paris, you know, how, how much they wanted reform. And that's going to play into what happens at the end of the 18th century. Thank you for staying to the end of my presentation. And if you haven't done so already, uh, you should definitely follow this lecture with my lecture on the relationship between Europe and the Americas in the years 1700 to 1800. So thank you for watching.